while scaling down the military budget. That's what President Obama is announcing today. As we look beyond the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the end of long-term nation building with large military footprints, we'll be able to ensure our security with smaller conventional ground forces. We'll continue to get rid of outdated Cold War era systems so that we can invest in the capabilities that we need mm. for the future. Well, the Obama administration now realizing the U.S. can't fight two wars at the same time anymore. It just costs too much money. Now the Department of Defense is trying to figure out how to cut some $400 billion in spending. And they say they can do this by ending the wars abroad and cutting back on other costs. The Pentagon certainly has a lot to work with with such a massive military budget. To try to put it into perspective, let's take a look at the U.S. military budget compared to other countries. Well, in 2011, the U.S. pumped $548 billion into the military. Compare that to $91 billion in China. Russia spent $63 billion. Iran, the country where the U.S. military is keeping close tabs on now, spent about $9 billion. And India spent $36 billion. But now that the U.S. is going broke, it says it needs to be more frugal in their spending, their military spending. This as they unveil plans for the most expensive piece of military equipment ever. Take a look at this. You are looking at the USS Gerald R. Ford, the biggest price tag for any single weapon in history. It cost a whopping $11.5 billion. That carrier is worth more than the GDPs of Nicaragua and Haiti combined. So is this what you call cutting back? Well, to look deeper into this, earlier I spoke to retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor. I asked him if this is money well spent. No, I, I don't think so. The real question for the American taxpayer is, are you getting something better, a, a dramatic leap ahead in capability than what you normally would get with a traditional carrier? And the answer is really no. It's very expensive. We've invested uh, in, in some new technologies, such as the uh, electromagnetic air left, uh, aircraft lift uh, system, which is designed to replace the catapult. It's troubled. We've got problems with it. It's not working properly. They'll eventually work through that. But the question is, do we really need it? What does it do for us that, that we don't already get from an existing carrier? And the, and the question is not much. When you're spending billions and billions of dollars in addition to what you normally spend, you expect a dramatic leap ahead. We don't get that with the F-35 either, which is designed to be launched from these carriers. And most of the things that people point to in the F-35 have to do with the intelligence reconnaissance, surveillance suite, the radars. All of those things could be refitted to F-15s and F-16s. So the bottom line is, if, if what you really need, if you're a cop on the beat in New York, what you need is a 38, and someone is trying to give the cop a, a laser pistol, does the cop need a laser pistol? And the answer is probably doesn't. So do we need to spend the money for these things? I'm not sure that we do. So you're saying that this is bigger, but not necessarily better. Not dramatically better. Not, be not good enough to justify the additional billions of dollars that we're investing in it. How then, why then spend billions and billions of dollars? I mean, this piece of equipment costs more than the GDPs of entire countries. Mm -hmm. Why then pump so much money into something like this? Well, there, there are other questions about the, the wisdom of this sort of thing. First of all, when you spend this much money on one platform, one ship, are, are you really going to put it at risk? What do you really plan to do with it? If you go back to the First World War at the Battle of Jutland, when the Royal Navy fought the, the German Navy, the Royal Navy commanders were very reluctant to commit all of their battleships because they were very expensive to build and they were afraid to lose them. We've, we're reaching that point where we're building something that we, we're afraid to lose. And there's nothing we can do uh, to prevent that from happening if we actually put it in harm's way. So the question is, do we want to build things that cost less? that are more, uh, that we can afford to lose, if you will, in combat? Or do we want to continue to put our money into these very large, expensive capital ships, which frankly, at sea, are becoming more and more vulnerable than they've ever been in our history? In fact, you go back to the 1950s and 60s, Admiral Rickover, the father of the nuclear Navy, Navy was asked uh, when he testified before the Senate in the 1970s, how long would our carriers last against the Soviet Navy at sea? And his answer was, uh, two or three days before they're sunk, uh, maybe a week if they stay in port. Well, that's because the submarine and, and submersibles, uh, unmanned uh, submersibles today, these kinds of things are so powerful and so difficult to track that they will put down capital ships like these aircraft carriers in a, in a serious 
conflict. So again, what's the rationale strategically for doing this? Uh, perhaps it's jobs, because clearly, you know, this creates a lot of employment in Norfolk, Virginia. Hmm. It's almost like a really nice car. You don't want to put it, you, if, you, yes. if it's, it's for show, but you yes. don't want to really put it in harm's way because Absolutely. it costs so much money. Um, I mean, do you think that the money spent on something like this can be better spent elsewhere? Yes, I do. I, but, but again, the Navy admirals uh, are stuck with the structure that they've had now since the end of the Second World War. They are doing the same thing that is being done in the Army and the Air Force to a lesser extent and certainly in the Marine Corps, and that is refit the old structures, the old ways of war, the single service war fighting establishments left over from 1945. We're refitting those. We're not building anything new. We're building a better version of what already exists, but it is so outrageously expensive and so much more vulnerable today. The question is, does it make sense monetarily? I don't think it does. The other problem with expense is that we've done a very poor job of, of containing expense. Uh, the acquisition system is flawed. We, we don't hold people accountable. Uh, when's the last time that we conducted an audit of the Department of Defense? We haven't. We haven't audited the Federal Reserve. We hear about that a great deal. We haven't audited the Department of Defense. And the recent announcement by the president on his new defense plans and strategies doesn't include any mention whatsoever of an audit of financial accountability. And we desperately need that. So money could be spent recklessly and the public wouldn't even know about it Absolutely. because there aren't these audits. And that's, that's happening as and, we sit here. Um, as you just said, President Obama today announced this plan to, um, to draw down troops, to decrease military spending um, but at the same time we have something like this in the works um, th this um, this military aircraft um, aircraft carrier uh, there seems to be a disconnect there well look there is no existential military threat to the United States there is no power out there today that that is organizing itself to take on and destroy the United States we know that we enjoy considerable lead in many key categories of military power that's not likely to change in the near term the point is this creates jobs. This is a, a big ticket item that's important to the defense industry. It's important to communities in the United States, the people that manufacture aircraft. We don't have, we're not going to occupy any more Muslim countries. That's been a disaster. Iraq and Afghanistan are strategic disasters, self-defeating enterprises. That's over. That was the signal. So what do you do? You reduce those ground forces. We've started with the Army. The Marine Corps will not escape this either. There will be more reductions after the next election. This is just the beginning. But there is no coherent strategy here. That doesn't exist. It's, well, we need to cut defense spending. So where do we cut first? We cut where it's easiest. And you go to the large United States Army, which was increased in size for the occupations in Iraq and Afghanistan. You make the cuts there. And you don't cut these big ticket items because jobs depend on it. Income depends on it. But um, while we are drawing troops out from Iraq, from Afghanistan, there is this mounting tension with Iran. Um, and I mean, do you think that the U.S. is ready to go to war with Iran? Well, going to war with Iran isn't very challenging, to be perfectly blunt. I mean, if the United States is 12 feet tall, Iran, in comparative terms, is maybe six inches high. It's a non-entity militarily. It can't project military power beyond its borders. The fear of Iran closing the Straits of Hormuz is much exaggerated. The Iranians would suffer terribly from that. Remember that about 83 percent of China's oil comes from the Middle East. It has to pass through the Strait of Hormuz, then through the Strait of Malacca and reach China. The Japanese, the Koreans are equally dependent upon it. No one, no one profits from the closure. Iran's revenues would tank. It's already going to suffer as a result of sanctions. Nothing would improve. We would not benefit. Uh, so uh, frankly speaking, this tension is artificial. Uh, it doesn't have to happen. It doesn't need to exist. Uh, the Iranians would do themselves an enormous favor by saying less. Uh, and we would do ourselves a favor by ignoring most of it because, quite frankly, it's, it's not important. They're not going to do it. We're not, we don't need to engage them. There's no, nothing to be gained mutually. All of this, I, I, sadly, I think is connected to Israel and the Israeli fear of Iran for, for rhetorical reasons more than military ones. And speaking of Israel, the U.S. Um, recently announced um, one of the biggest uh, huge military buildup in Israel. And Israel, um, as we're seeing, is ready to go to war with Iran. So if Israel um, does go to war with Iran, I mean, by default, is the U.S. also 
can be involved in it. Well, that I think is probably the Israeli plan. That's what they would like to see happen. Uh, I think that would be unfortunate because I, I just don't see any benefit to it. And I think that ultimately, if we can exercise some patience and some restraint over time, uh, we may see the conditions in the region change rather dramatically. Uh, the Turks are the most powerful military force in the region. Turkey also has interests. It has interests in Iraq along with Iran. They're increasingly in conflict with each other. Uh, we don't need to become involved in these things, but we could ultimately help to sort some of it out from a distance if we don't become directly engaged. And as far as Israel's concerned, uh, war with Iran would not involve an Iranian invasion of Israel or an in Israeli invasion of Iran. They, they would trade strikes with each other. And I'm sure that the, the Iranians would try to use their proxies. Because remember, Iranian influence depends on Shiite populations. You have that in southern Lebanon. You have some very, very small a number in Syria. You have them in Iraq and in the Emirates and eastern Saudi Arabia. Their principal tool is subversion. Uh, that's how they would probably try to counter the Israelis. But, but quite frankly, again, you know, I hope the Israelis will back away from this because I think uh, it's, it's unnecessary. I think there are alternative ways to deal with this. But the Israelis have reached a point now where, honestly, they don't believe there is. Many of the top leaders feel they have to do this. Certainly a lot of tension and a lot of instability in the area. Douglas, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you.